Welcome back to the Quantum Guide Show. Today in episode 161, I'm very happy to bring back my friend Preston Dennett to talk about his latest book, Not From Here, Volume 5. Preston Dennett began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic unexplained encounters. Since then, he has interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. He is a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, also known as MUFON, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of 30 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. He is a frequent guest on radio and TV and speaks across the United States. You can find more about Preston at his website, www.prestondennett.weebly.com. Preston is here to tell you that UFOs are real. As the UFO cover-up crumbles, disclosure is happening before our very eyes, and Preston continues his outgoing quest to share the truth about UFOs and, ex and the extraterrestrial presence on planet Earth. As with other volumes of Not From Here, this book takes the reader into the heart of the UFO phenomenon, shedding light into the darkest corners of ufology, sorry, ufology, and exploring the unknown aspects of UFO research. With hundreds of first-hand cases from early history, to the present day, coming from across the world, Volume 5 presents a startling view into the fascinating subject. It's time to move past ridicule, skepticism, and disbelief. UFOs are real and the proof is here. To find out more about Preston Dennett, all of the links are featured below in the description. Do check us out, subscribe to our channels, Leave us comments and like our videos. Today we're going to talk about Not From Here, Volume 5. Be sure to share this fascinating discussion with your friends. Preston, so nice to have you back. How are you? Having me back. I'm doing well, Karen. Thank you. Hope you're doing well, too. Yeah, I am. Thank you so much. So I'm really excited about your new book. And... Um, what I really liked about it was the way it flows from chapter to chapter, or even paragraph to paragraph. You've got a real gift when it comes to making the reader really comfortable. And what I also really liked about it is how well researched it is. And you provide a bibliography so people can find all your sources. And I thought that was very, very, uh, very well done, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, I work hard at it. Because it always kind of irks me a little bit when I read stuff in someone's book. I'm like, well, where did they get this? I want to follow up on this. So I've made a point. I, well, I always do when I put stuff out because we do need to be careful about information, particularly in this field with so much disinformation and speculation that uh, I really wanted it to be accessible to people. Yeah, it sure is. So I thought we could start off with um, chapter one, where you talk about UFO swarms. So most of us think of UFO sightings as um, seeing, you know, a flashing light in the sky that's <clears throat> definitely not a plane and not an asteroid or anything like that. And it sometimes comes closer and then just disappears or darts off at an angle. Sometimes people see two or three. But according to your book, um, it's not that unusual to see what we would call swarms of UFOs. That would be kind of unsettling. Do you want to tell us more about that? I mean, it's not at all unusual to see multiple objects in the sky. In fact, I was looking at encounters and most, I'm not going to say most, but a good number of them do involve multiple objects, one or two, three, four. Not at all unusual to see five or 10 or even 20. But once you start going above that, it's very unusual. And there are only a handful of cases involving you know, 50 or more objects. I started looking into that after I got my own case during the Topanga Canyon UFO wave. 
Topanga, of course, is right outside of Los Angeles, right along the coastline. And on June 14th, 1992, I don't know what happened. <laughs> the skies opened up. People all over this little community, 8,000 residents or so back then, started were seeing stuff. I mean, they called the police. They called the local newspaper. I got some calls. <laughs> Uh, I ended up doing a really big investigation into it. And on that night alone, I found like 30 separate, you know, independent adult witnesses in various locations throughout the canyon who saw craft on that night. Some were driving down the road and one craft followed them. One guy, he says five or six were swarming around his truck. He's going down. Another said they saw three. One guy pulled over. He says he saw a large mothership-like object, and 20 or more objects were swirling around it. So these were all on the same exact night. And I found one couple who lived very high on the ridge. This is about 2,000 feet high. Um, it's called uh, Saddle Peak, and it overlooks the ocean. You know, it overlooks the whole area. And they, very early in the evening, it had just started to get dark were drawn outside by flashes of light and saw like 10 objects coming out from below, from behind a ridge. That in itself is unusual <laughs> because when someone sees a UFO, it's usually, you know, a dot in the sky and it comes swooping down or, you know, mm -hmm. it's on the horizon, it comes towards them. These were coming from below. Really unusual in that regard. But it kept happening. <laughs> and they kept getting drawn outside. And finally, you know, third or fourth time, she's like, I'm going to start counting these because 10 or 20 objects are coming up little oval things they stop dart 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 a couple of times coming right over their head really freaked them out because they got a good look at them they were sort of half disc almost or slightly boomerang shaped uh, and this went on for about two to three hours uh, eight to ten or 11 finally they actually went inside <laughs> And uh, closed the curtains and went to bed because they couldn't take it anymore. She counted, get this, 200 objects. Wow. Can you imagine? You know, I went up there. I interviewed them face to face. When she said that, uh, I'm like, wow. And the husband shook his head. He's like, well, I don't know if it was that many. I thought it might have been closer, closer to 100. It's yeah. still Forget a lot. <laughs> I burst that's... out laughing because I thought, well, <laughs> either way, that's a lot. And and she looked at him and was like, no, no, no. She said, well, you're right. You counted them. I wasn't. She called the police the next day. They said, no, we got no calls. That turned out to be a lie. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they did that. But yeah, that was a lot of objects in one night. And I got other people, you know, other reports that obviously confirmed that. So I started looking, I heard about other cases, right? I'm like, let's do a deep dive into this. And the first case that really grabbed my attention was a very early case. Now, the modern age of UFOs began in 1947, right? You know, the Kenneth Arnold <laughs> over Mount Rainier, the Roswell crash, a huge super wave basically swept across the US and the world. People, I mean, never before have we had anything like this. Now, I found this case from New York, which occurred on February 20th, 1947. Comes from a college student who was walking with his friend one evening when the guy, one of the professors in the observatory, comes running out and grabs them. He says, I need you to look at this. I'm like, okay. Takes them into the observatory and has them look through the telescope. He says, don't say anything. Just look for one minute and tell me what you see. And so they did. And th they saw this line of objects going through the viewfinder there. One, 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 one after another until they counted over 100. And they all appeared to be following this in a little wobbly fashion, which makes sense to me because we hear this in UFO reports where UFOs kind of have a falling leaf motion or a wobbly motion. Mm -hmm. That's them following the magnetic field lines of our planet. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about this case is they weren't visible apparently to the naked eye. They were 
quite a ways up there. But this is immediately prior to so many people all over the world seeing so many craft. So it was like they arrived en masse. I don't know where they were <laughs> parking <laughs> or what have you, but man, oh man, that was the first case that really like, wow, that's a lot of objects to see at once. Mm -hmm. uh, and they left, you know, it was still going on when they left. Can you imagine? Mm, no, I've never seen a swarm. That's amazing. I've seen individual craft. I've seen different different shapes. They're, they're, each, each sighting that I saw was completely different, um, you know, and um, uh, one was um, cigar shaped. Another one was at night and all I saw was the lights. I was driving up Vancouver Island and I looked out over the water and I saw two headlights facing me. I thought it was a car parked on one of the small islands facing me. But then as I left and traveled north, it kept pace with me. So I knew it, it couldn't have been. So that was pretty exciting too. Yeah. Can I, can I tell you another case? Which sure, is please favorite? do. <laughs> this one occurred on March 17, 1950. And I have to tell you, there's not another case like this ever before or since. Not quite no, like this. This is in the little town of Farmington, New Mexico which, you know, not huge, 3,000, 4,000 people in the town proper, but surrounding areas, up to 6,000 people. And on that St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> everyone went rushing out of their houses. Businesses stopped. Everyone came running out. Traffic stopped. Most of the town saw this. There were at least half. And what they saw was in the early morning, hundreds, two, three hundred, four hundred objects darting around, quite high up to a very low level. Little disks, big disks, larger craft emitting smaller craft, different, mostly white, but some red colored, mm -hmm. uh, some metallic. There were a few people who said they came low enough they could see portholes, but they were flying in formations, triangular formations, they were doing loop-de-loops. They were coming at each other and turning, doing right angles, hovering, every kind of maneuver we see in these reports. And it went on for an hour. Of course, okay. it was photographed, mm -hmm. which you would think, you know, someone would have the presence of mind to take a photograph. And they did. Uh, so, yeah, the mayor saw it. All the police saw it. Reporters saw it. So this was absolutely undeniable. It stopped. An hour went by and they came back and did it again. Hmm. So what is going on here? <laughs> this is yep. what UFO researchers call a display. Mm -hmm. I think it was Frank Salisbury, a biologist from Utah, who became a UFO researcher when he was researching area in the Wintaw Basin, coincidentally, by Skinwalker Ranch, but in, near Roosevelt, Utah. And he wrote this book called The Utah UFO Display. And he was pretty much the one who coined that term because he kept getting cases where these objects, which are, let's face it, normally evasive, you know, they're not out there. <laughs> you can't just walk out and see a UFO at any given time. But sometimes they absolutely will put on a show. And that's what was clearly, undeniably going on here. And what an event. I mean, this garnered national headlines because so many people saw it. Mm -hmm. And of course, our Air Force, <laughs> God bless them, bungled it and said, no, nothing to it. No comment. They, they uh, really this... lost credibility. They really lost credibility because when you have two or three or more people all view the same incident, it's obviously not a mistake, not an illusion, not a delusion. And it's happening so often that now <clears throat> the powers that be that claim this isn't happening have just completely lost credibility. Not agree more. That's why I think it's ridiculous to even look to our governments for answers on this. Our, mm -hmm. gosh, in our government, our military, Pentagon, I hate to blame, you know, senators and 
representatives and governors or really even presidents because how much power do they have mm -hmm. it's really you know the highest levels of the military the military industrial complex um even beyond that it's a secret government to some extent uh, mm -hmm. that's it really is. controlling this and yeah so what do you think they stand to gain by um denying all of this obvious evidence yeah a lot of bad karma right off <laughs> Uh, but for, in their minds, I think what they're trying to gain is power over the people, control, mm -hmm. uh, money. Uh, but, you know, to me, it's a terrible decision. It's not something anyone with of any level of sanity would do. Lying is just everyone knows it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, so it's clear that their motives are not altruistic. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's very selfish. I think it's all about greed and control. Ultimately, I think that's what it comes down to. And what uh, about keeping um, humanity from more efficient forms of energy that may even not cost anything, you know, maybe yeah. beyond the initial technology, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, um, there are people that are freezing to death all over the world every year, and um, people who live in such terrible poverty or they don't even have a, a fuel source for cooking their food. Not everybody in the world, you know, lives the way you and I get to live. And um, so, yeah, again, I guess that goes back to power and greed, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I think it's the oil industry, you know, because they that's the last thing they want is because they want their money from the oil. It's, you know, the drug, the pharmaceutical industry. Because let's face it, there's healing technology that they've got. We know this. Mm -hmm. ET, that's the ET agenda, largely. Uh, we know they've got technology that can do amazing things. And some of this has been pilfered, I guess is the best word, from trash retrieval. And pharmaceutical, you know, business. Uh, I mean, uh, health is a business. Disease is a business. I mean, it shouldn't yeah. be. It's yeah. absurd. So yeah, yeah, people are starving to death. They're going hungry. They're, there's a quote energy crisis. It's manufactured. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's ultimately I think what's behind the the cover up and the suppression of technology. And it's such a shame. It's such a bad decision because ultimately, that's the ET threat. It's not to us and humanity. It's to the power and control that the one percenters have overall humanity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's coming their their <clears throat> day is coming oh, yeah so um <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um so a little bit further on i want to a little bit get into you know what their message is for humanity and what why why they're coming but I'm wondering if you if you could tell us a bit about the CE5 movement. That's chapter two, calling all UFOs. Now, I you, you know, some of us are familiar with Dr. Stephen Greer and his protocols and some of his experiences. But I was surprised to find out about um, these other experiences where people are setting up different lighting displays for different purposes. Do you want to tell us about a few of those and what happened? I'm really actually proud of finding these few cases because they turned out to have a little bit of an influence in this whole movement. And certainly I'm not taking credit for it by any means, <laughs> but it, we all play a role. And it was very cool to see how this rolled out because I had interviewed this guy by the name of Arnie Weiler, who was a set dresser for NBC. And it was in May of 1983. He was working on this little project with this special effects guy by the name of Rick Liebert and several other people where they were setting up a publicity stunt for NBC involving computerized pitch lights. These are very bright lights, which can be computerized and change colors and so forth. And they were setting up this display that is basically a half disc or almost a full disc really of a peacock's tail, the NBC logo, of course. So they had it all laid out on the ground, all the lights on, and it was going to rise up and flash all these lights and make this beautiful display. 
and they turned it on. This is at night. And now if you picture this, it does look very much like a disc on the ground, right? <laughs> a flying saucer. This is my theory as to what happened here. <laughs> because they turned it on and darned if three glowing objects of some kind didn't come swooping down out of nowhere. I mean, no one saw where they came from. They just came boom and immediately caught Arnie's attention. My dad works in the film business and he's the one who kind of said, I want you, and I've got a guy for you to interview. <laughs> he had an encounter. He wants to talk to you about it. This is Arnie, of course. And Arnie sees these three objects and he's like, oh my gosh. And he turns to the guy who's behind all the special effects set up, Rick Liebert, and says, look, what's that? And Rick is very just kind of casual about it. It's like, oh, there they are again, UFOs. They keep showing up when I do this kind of stuff. <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding. He's like, no, no, this, this has happened before. And so I'm interviewing Arnie about this. I'm like, wow. Do you think they were coming to, he said, to check out the lights, the peacocks? He says, that's what it looked like, because they took a quick look-see, and off they went. So I, I'm like, can I talk to Rick? I've got to talk to Rick, <laughs> Rick Lieber, because he's the guy who sets up this and said it happened before. And sure enough, I talked to him, really nice guy. Turns out he's a big shot. I had no idea. I'm just, <laughs> I'm in my early 20s doing bookkeeping and he's a pretty well-known guy radio dj and working with a lot of very famous musicians and owns his own special effects company uh and he just said that he had another incident because i asked him about this he verified it i'm like can you remember any others he's like, well you know it happens several times but the one that i really remember gosh let me see i think it was in 1978 and uh he and his team, his crew, had gone down to San Diego to do a stunt for a radio station. And what they did was they got this spectrophysics argon laser, um, which shoots out this green laser beam and would play in tune to Pink Floyd and other rocks, you know, rock songs. So they got it all set up in what was then the tallest building in San Diego, a bank building and turn this thing on and it's going on and off a lot of people saw this but what a lot of people didn't see and what rick and his team saw was this craft came zooming down and he said it was a big v you know uh that's the best way a chevron shaped object which came right low over the building and he says it couldn't have been more than 50 feet up had lights on either arm of this v made a low buzzing noise. He says there was another one kind of up and higher up and a little bit smaller, but probably the same size, just farther away and just moved right overhead. So yeah, this was a publicity stunt <laughs> designed to attract attention. And I think it attracted the kind of attention they weren't quite expecting. Mm -hmm. And I started looking into other cases and I did, I found some, there was a light festival in Nevada where they turned on all these light sculptures, and sure enough, a UFO came swooping down, apparently to take a look at it. And so what I did is I wrote this up in an article for UFO Universe magazine, and I called it Calling All UFOs, and kept myself busy with other cases until Stephen Greer comes to town, because he's forming CSETI. This is the Center for Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, whose goal is to basically open a dialogue and form a relationship with the ETs, initiate UFO encounters. Because uh, this is something people have been doing for a long time. But he popularized it with his mm -hmm. group and really brought it to the forefront. So really good work there for Dr. Greer. And I wasn't going to go to the meeting because it was expensive. Honestly, it was like $300, I think. Like, I just can't afford it. <laughs> You know, I'm working as a bookkeeper. I don't make a whole lot of money. And uh, the newspaper called me and said, you know, I have no idea why we're doing this, but we want to pay your way if you'll write an article. Nice. So I'm like, wow. It turned out to be a really pivotal moment because I met a contactee 
I, I met a really good friend. Um, I mean, it opened up a lot of doors for me. But I'm there in the audience and Stephen Greer is talking. He's like, okay, I'd like to talk about how we call down UFOs. And here's the, this great case I found by researcher Preston Dennett. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and nice. he listed, yeah, this, she says, this is a prime example of how you can call down UFOs. This, this is like the number one case I found. And then he said, here's another one. And this is also by, from Preston Dennett. <laughs> Grinning, I'm like, whoa. And he listed a few more that he had found and basically outlined his, what he calls the contact trilogy or this, the protocols for calling down UFOs. And we went out that night to Santa Susana Pass, not far away, this is outside of LA, but a slightly rural area overlooking the city. Um, so not too rural. <laughs> We no sooner did we get there, Karen. There must have been forty people there, fifty, um, and it was a cold night. It was freezing, and uh, someone shouts out, "What's that?" Look, <laughs> and I'm like, "You got to be kidding me!" And he, everyone starts looking up. Of course, we, I did, and way the heck up there. Yeah, it was up way up there, twenty, thirty, forty thousand feet. Was this enormous light? And I have taken enough astronomy. You know, I'm really into it. I, I do my research. But I knew instantly this wasn't a satellite. This wasn't a fireball. It's not a helicopter plane. Anything that I could conventionally explain. It had a really odd shape. It was like this blob of light. And it was moving very slowly. Just a few arcs. And basically was there for just, couldn't have been more than five or ten seconds. Mm -hmm. But it was so big. I mean, this was about half the size of a full moon, a quarter moon or a half moon, maybe. Mm -hmm. And boom, it was gone. And I was in. I'm like, let's go. Because we went up the next night. And this time there was maybe 10 or 20 of us. I'm like, Are these people crazy? Do they not want to see a UFO? I thought, you know, everybody would go. But we ended up forming a core group on that night of about 10 of us, 15. And sure enough, yeah, these weird, gosh, strobe-like flashes came down over our group. And it was different because you could almost feel the light. I don't even know how to describe it, but it was just different from a normal light. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, we would go out every one to two months, every th three months, late, late at night. Oh, it's exhausting. I'd go to work the next day destroyed. <laughs> We'd stay up till 3 or 4 a.m. And uh, I would say about 20% of the time, we would see stuff. Little lights flashing at us, mostly. One of the best times was at that same spot. We had just packed up, nothing showed up. And often we're very aware because this is when the darn things will come. <laughs> and like, hi, hi, bye. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically packed up and we're heading on down the trail back to our cars. And a flash of light caught my eye. And I looked up, because it had come from the mountaintop, Rocky Peak, just across the way, a mile or two away. And I'm like, whoa, guys, I'm pretty sure I saw something. I was the first one who saw it. And uh, we all stopped. and like, are you sure? Are you sure? It's not a reflection. I'm like, mm, I saw something. And then it flashed again. It was a big, bright light, really bright. But it was on the mountaintop. So I'm thinking, well, I don't know. That could be a hiker up there. How would he know we're, we're here? I was kind of on the fence. But we pulled out our lights, of course, and we started flashing back and forth. It would flash. We would flash. We'd flash twice. It would flash twice. This went on for 10, 20 minutes. And I'm still on the fence. I'm thinking, mm, I don't know. These are bright lights, but this is on the surface of the ground. And how do I know that this is anything unusual? Then the darn thing flashed the biggest prismatic red light you've ever seen, which I just don't see how a person could do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not a tail light. This was not a flashlight with a red filter. This was a huge, brilliant, beautiful, prismatic rose red light. And then I knew, I'm like, that's unusual. <laughs> Uh, so that, yeah, I became a charter member of C-SETI, and we had a lot of good sightings. 
and I talked to Stephen Greer about it, you know, because we we would take him up, and I did the show Encounters, and we set it found a spot to try to call down UFOs for the TV show. One actually showed up, a little unexplained light, but he was very gracious and said, you know, I need to thank you for that article you wrote. I'm like, oh yeah, that was my case. He's like, yeah, I know. Um, thanks for putting that out because it really gave me an inspiration, a little kick in the butt. Uh, and he said he got a message from the ETs. It's now time to pick up what you have dropped, which was his plan to do mm -hmm. this C SETI group. So yeah, we each play a little bit of a role. Uh, and it was very cool to see that, you know, wow, you know, I think these ETs know what they're doing mm -hmm. and how it influences people and ripples outward. Mm -hmm. Because that became a very influential thing. And close encounters of the fifth kind, as we now call them, have moved to the forefront of UFO research. And I love it because UFO research is often relegated to basically studying UFO reports. Mm -hmm. When with this method, you can actually go out there and do live field work and see it yourself. You know, you can bring other people who've never had an encounter to see it. Researchers can be, you know, actually have live field work study. And furthermore, it develops the relationship between us and ETs. So I think it's got a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Because, um, um, you know, to be honest with you, um, I, I feel like the world leaders do not speak for me. The military does not speak for me. And this this planet belongs to all of us. We share it, but doesn't belong to us. We don't own it. But I mean... You know, we're the citizens here. We're the natural residents here. And um, if ET, you know, uh, wants permission or exchange information, it should be with us, not with these world leaders who are, um, like we mentioned earlier, are all about power and money and control and, th and things like that. Hi, guys. Break time for a short message. YouTube will not monetize me, so if you enjoy my content and want to support my efforts, help me to cover my expenses by visiting my shop to buy yourself a beautiful Orgon generator. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand, and they are ethically sourced, handmade, and double-charged for maximum effect. They are only available through my website, www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. Dot com. Many people are finding comfort with Zendome's organ generators, commonly called Organite. They are a simple compound which balance ambient energy by converting negative energy and EMF into positive healing energy with many easily confirmed health benefits. They are a simple compound with alchemic and energetic properties. These devices function as self-driven, continuously operating, highly efficient, negative to positive energy transmutation factories. They help diminish the harmful effects of electromagnetic frequency radiation by attracting and converting negative energies, retuning them into new and more healthful sound and light wave patterns. And they help to purify the atmosphere and accelerate plant growth they also help stimulate positive mood and are a natural remedy for poor sleep patterns. When Organite is within range of any corded or wireless electronic device, it will efficiently and continuously transform that energy into Orgone as it is being transmitted. This essentially creates Orgone energy transmitters out of any and all emitters of harmful negative energy. You can use these devices for focusing the mind, healing, meditation, and for spiritual growth. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand of organ generators, and they are only available through my website. Don't be fooled by imitations. Check out my website to see my latest selection at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. That's K A R E N. H O L T O N healthcoach.com. Check them out today. Now, let's get back to the show.
We shouldn't so, even call them leaders. Are they're controllers? <laughs> That's what they are. <laughs> yeah, I, I I usually refer to them as the parasite class because I, don't see, <laughs> I like it. I don't see anything elite about them. I just don't, you know. And yeah. anyway, we're the biggest. Guess. We're the strongest force in the on this planet. The people. Yeah, we're the ones who are actually responsible for the this planet. Yeah. Yep, we're supposed to be stewards of the earth, I think. So So that sort of, let's just sort of segue now into astronomers. Now, you would think that people that spend a lot of time looking at the sky, you know, would see more often um, things like UFOs. Um, I find it frustrating when people like um, Elon Musk say, Oh, there's no such thing as ETs or spaceships. I'm in the space business. And if there was something like that, I would have seen it. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe he spends too much time in his office and not enough time looking at the stars. What's your take on, on astronomers and UFO sightings? This is the chapter I decided to include because I became infuriated when I would hear people say, no, oh, no astronomers have seen UFOs. I'm like, hold on, what? <laughs> have you not done your research? Uh, because yes, they have, and there's a lot of them, and some are very high profile. And I would, and it goes way, way back. I would point to Edmund Halley, who back in the 1600s, 1700s, Halley, of course, the discoverer of Halley's Comet, mm -hmm. uh, reported seeing UFOs not just once or twice, you know, a few times. Uh, and a large glowing object, one that remained in the sky for quite some time. He couldn't describe it as anything conventional. And of course, oh gosh, uh, Sir William Herschel, who is very well known for discovering the planet Uranus. Uh, he was born in 1730s and became a very prominent astronomer. And he described seeing all kinds of stuff. He would see these really weird lights on the moon, which we now, it's, it is scientifically verified. They're called transient lunar phenomena, TLP. And for a long time, people thought, well, maybe the moon's seismically active and this is what we're seeing. No, no, because um, some of these are in patterns uh, and it's quite consistent. I mean, there's a lot of these reports, not just a few. And he described seeing those as well as other stuff, uh, including, you know, objects that he described as oval or disc shaped, <laughs> moving across the sky in unconventional movements. So these are very early reports. And of course, there are some more modern accounts. Uh, I think one of my favorite comes from Clyde Tombaugh who he secured his pl place in astronomy fame when he discovered the planet Pluto. And uh, he had this amazing sighting in New Mexico with his family when they saw, all of them, saw this object moving across the sky. And he said he was so astonished that he kind of was not a great observer. He says, I'll, I'll admit, it shocked me so bad. I didn't take notes as well as I should have he's looking at this darn thing and he could immediately see that this was a structured craft mm -hmm. and as it got closer and closer there were li little portholes on it and he ended up becoming a proponent of this subject and one of almost no scientists at this time uh, jalen hynek was still towing the party line and saying ah hoaxes hallucinations misperceptions all scientists were. So he was pretty much alone at that time. Of course, shortly later, we would have Hynek and James McDonald and Leo Sprinkle and Walter Webb, another uh, astronomer who basically became a believer after his own sighting. So yeah, he became very vocal. You know, he got a lot of publicity when he discovered Pluto. But when he started talking about his UFO sighting, Nobody seemed to pay attention or really care. Mm -hmm. It infuriated him because like this is evidence that we are being visited by another civilization. I and mean, he was unequivocal about it. And there's so many astronomers who have had these kinds of sightings. I, I just, people are absolutely dead wrong when they say astronomers aren't seeing UFOs. 
They are. Yeah, it seems to be part of the denial, the whole denier thing. And and I understand why people tote the line because the um the agencies or the the groups that fund a lot of the scientific research will pull funding if the scientists and um you know don't tote the line, don't um support the the propaganda. And um, you know, um if you've worked very hard going to university and you're lucky enough to get a job in, in the field that you're interested in. And then to have that, um, you know, have them threaten to take that all away and ruin your reputation. Plus, there are those who've been made an example of, you know, it's um, it's hard to stand up for, for what you know to be true. Yeah, it really is. So kudos to all of these guys. It's funny that you say that because that's exactly what Jay Allen Hynek found out. He is an astronomer, of course. He was the astronomical consultant for Project Blue Book. And he surveyed a bunch of astronomers and asked them if they had seen UFOs, like over a thousand of them. And he got responses from like 60 of them who said, yes, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And a bunch said, well, no, but even if I did, no, I'm not talking about it. Mm -hmm. How is that science? It's not. It's not science, no. No. And Jacques Vallée, of course, we all know Jacques Vallée. He's a superstar in this field. Another really honest-to-God scientist who was a pioneering researcher and looking into this was at an observatory when they were tracking unknown objects. And to his absolute astonishment and disgust, they destroyed evidence. Mm -hmm. UFOs destroyed it. And they're like, he's like, why are you doing this? Says, well, we can't explain this. We don't talk about this. <laughs> and that's what brought him into this field. He's like, this is not scientists. You know, this is not science. This is not right. We need to look into this. And it totally changed his life. And of course, he became one of the leading researchers on this planet. Mm -hmm. one, one more case, if I may. Sure, sure. <laughs> I love this case from Frank Halstead, a really prominent astronomer who was uh, with his wife on a train going through Death Valley in California. And she points out the window. She's like, look, honey, what's that? And he said he saw this 200 foot wide blimp shaped object traveling over the ridge. This is not too far away. And he's thinking, well, that can't be a blimp. It's too big. It's moving too fast. And then another sh object showed up smaller and it's darting around and it's a saucer. He's like, this is a absolute saucer he wrote a big long write-up on it was very vocal and became extremely critical of all the astronomers who were making negative statements on ufos and weren't being scientific about it and he would, would always share his encounter and say we need to take this seriously this was a structured craft i saw we don't have anything like this i think it's controlled by intelligent beings from beyond earth I mean, he made no bones about it. He said it was extraterrestrial. And I don't know why this isn't more well known. Because, you know, Cis, what's his name? Um, La Paz, um, Lincoln La Paz, also another hugely prominent astronomer, also saw UFOs. Um, Schalbach, he worked at White Sands. He saw this incredible object. He's like, this is not a meteor, look at this. <laughs> He didn't know that there was another guy about 17 miles away also watching it. And they got the two reports together and they were able to triangulate and see that this object was moving at several thousand miles an hour. Now, meteors move at like 30, 40,000 miles an hour, you know, really fast. This was too slow to be a meteor. Mm -hmm. He says, I've observed thousands of meteors. It's not a meteor. And Walter Webb, I think it was, or one of the, another astronomer, it wasn't Walter Webb, says, you need to report this. It was Clyde Tombaugh. That's right. said, you need to report this to Project Blue Book. <laughs> and they did. And they did this whole write-up. You know, we've seen meteors. This wasn't a meteor. We think this was a UFO. You should investigate this. Well, Project Blue Book, all, whenever they received a good case, they didn't like it. They would not pay attention. They were looking for people who saw Venus, and that's what they would publicize. So when this report came in, 
they were between a rock and a hard place because these are astronomers. And what they, I couldn't believe what they did. They did no investigation and said, it's a meteor. That's what they called it. It's a meteor. They're talking to two professional astronomers and these Blue Book officers are not trained astronomers. They're military officers mm -hmm. uh, with no astronomical training. <laughs> um, yeah, they tried to debunk it. It's ridiculous because they said in the report, this is not a meteor. And that was their explanation. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Yeah. Well, we're just going to have to just pull um, due disclosure on our own. You know, enough of us coming together, talking about things, and we'll just do it on our own and to heck with them. They can't yeah. hold us back. I'm wondering, um, Preston, if we could talk a little bit, another really interesting chapter. They're all interesting chapters, trust me. Folks, you really definitely want to pick up this book. Um, but in Chapter 4, um, apparently, at some of the UFO conferences, actual aliens have attended. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I, you know, I had a little bit of fun with this chapter because I was intrigued by my own experiences. Uh, I went to this conference, uh, the Triad Conference, in 1994. There was a lot of speakers there, Bud Hopkins, Don Ecker, Yvonne Smith, Colin Andrews, some of the big shots in the field. I'm just a little guy kind of new to the field. Uh, I got involved in 86, 88 became active. So this is just a few years in. Mm -hmm. and I'm writing a few articles at this point, and that's about it. Two years later, I would put out my first book. <laughs> but I went down to hear the speakers I had a friend who lived in San Diego, so I thought, well, this will be great. I don't have to pay for a hotel. <laughs> and I uh, was staying at his house. Well, you know, it was a great conference. Turns out there was a lot of Secret Service agents there. Because President Clinton, by coincidence, was visiting at that time <laughs> and staying right where the conference was being held at the Del Coronado Hotel. So that was a weird coincidence, which turned out to be significant because on the night before the conference, there was a group of six people in the village inn hotel, literally a stone's throw from where I was staying and a stone's throw from the conference, who had, were pulled on board, had greys come into their room. I ended up writing a book on their experience called the Coronado Island UFO incident. Yvonne Smith also wrote a book on this case because she found more witnesses. I found two more, so it's a total of eight. She found five or 10 more. There was a mass encounter on that night. Now, this isn't at the conference proper, right? It's not like in the conference, but darn close. I thought, wow, that's amazing. Coronado Island is not a place you'd expect there to be an encounter. It's very densely populated. It's got a very active huge police force it's a tourist trap it's a navy island partly i mean this is where the navy seals do their training there's a half of it's navy owned and of course the secret service running around with president clinton coming the next day <laughs> really unusual and didn't think much of it other than like well why well, nothing happened to me but later I was at another conference in Irvine speaking about USOs. And, you know, it was great. I got to meet Linda Zimmerman and Lynn, oh gosh, Stanton Friedman, that's his name, and uh, other huge figures in this field. And did my speech on USOs. I woke up that morning feeling a little strangely unwell because I had been fine the night before. Uh, and I just kind of attributed it to nerves, though I don't usually get that nervous. So it was a little strange. But then I found out <laughs> on some time later that there is a gentleman, Mike Knox, an army officer, a good witness, who says that he was in his hotel room at the conference and was visited by Grays, who came in and healed his Achilles tendon, which required surgery, by the way, he was going to have surgery. Uh, but Grays came in and basically stitched it up. 
Uh, this is what he says. And uh, he's done conferences about it, describing his experience. I mean, he's gone public. He had a witness who was in the hotel with, with him who saw grays. He himself didn't see them, uh, but he did have some unusual experiences. There was a mark on his leg and turned out there was another lady at the conference who reported her experience to New Fork National UFO Reporting Center saying she was pulled on board out of her hotel room, saw some of the speakers on board. I was a speaker. <laughs> so, hmm, I don't, I don't remember anything. And she didn't name names. Her report was anonymous, so I can't contact her. But I thought, wow, that's two reports. And a third one came in from someone, a couple of people actually, a group of people were outside the hotel and said that they saw UFOs over the hotel that evening. So I'm like, wow, here it is again. <laughs> then I, this guy put out a book of the blue beings at a UFO conference. And I thought, wow, could this be a thing? And that case is somewhat controversial. I did talk to someone who was there at that incident where people reportedly saw these tall blue beings. She's like, you know, I don't know if they were ETs. They looked a little unusual. Their skin wasn't blue. Uh, but some people who were there swear up and down they saw stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and this guy wrote a book about it. But that's neither here nor there because I found other cases. <laughs> uh, Janet Lesson, she was at a conference and a bunch of people, she sa said that they saw an extremely tall man who they all thought looked extraterrestrial. She says she didn't see him, but she got a lot of reports from people there swerving on that guy was not normal. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that anyone had a direct um, evidence that he was ET, but there was a conference in South America where apparently an ET appeared and shot a little beam of light at the speaker, G General Ochoa, right when he started to speak on stage and then disappeared in a flash of light. It caused complete chaos. I couldn't get super good verification of it, but there was one case that was really well verified. And this was at Contact in the Desert, mm -hmm. in Joshua Tree. And I like this case because while it only involves UFOs, boy, does it ever <laughs> involve UFOs. Because some hundred people or more, and a good 20 of them submitted reports, said that multiple objects were seen over a period of about one to two hours. This green glowing object came swooping in, would stop, and then dart off followed by a blue one, and then a red one, and yellow one, and multicolored objects, which is important because, you know, if this is just a white light moving along or a red and white light, you know, mm -hmm. plain, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes multiple objects, and they were moving in an unconventional way at times. They would stop. They would go straight up. They were filmed. They were photographed. They were viewed through binoculars. They were viewed through night vision goggles. Melinda Leslie was there. She's very prominent in this field. She wrote up a very lengthy report. And I found quite a few reports firsthand from people. And there was a lot of ooing and eyeing and people jumping up and down. I find this so interesting because what better place would a UFO show up than where all the UFO folks are gathered? Mm -hmm. If you go to a conference, most of these people are contactees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why they're there. And the UFO researchers, of course. I mean, what better place to do a little disclosure event, which is one of the ETs' goals? Again, we don't need our governments. The, you know, the ETs are basically have a publicity campaign, and that's what they were doing. And I think it was very effective, and it was a perfect place to do it. So I didn't find as many cases as I thought I might, and I found some that were a bit questionable. And I put that in the book. I'm like, well, I don't know about this one, but, you know, take it or leave it. Here's the mm -hmm. resource. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can look at it. There was one at Giant Rock, which was the first really successful convention back in the 50s. Still one of the biggest. And apparently an ET showed up there. UFOs showed up on a couple of occasions. A police officer photographed it. It's a photograph that's pretty good. It hasn't been explained. So, yeah, I think this is something that definitely deserves closer look, a little more research. And I'm hoping this 
flushes out some more cases. Mm-hmm. You know, people are so afraid to talk about this kind of stuff, especially if it's got high strangeness in any level. You know, the stranger it is, people are more reluctant <laughs> uh, to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I kind of had fun with that chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was great. So um, you've also written about um, a chapter on UFOs and the American sitcom, the twin connection, and also that aliens have names. But I'm wondering if we could jump ahead to chapter eight and talk about you have been warned, because I think it's important to point out to the folks that there's a purpose. This isn't just for our entertainment, um, that there's actually a purpose to why ETs are here. Uh, Obviously, they're concerned about us. I think if they were going to hurt us, they would have done that a long time ago. Um, And I do do think that they care about us, but also they care about the planet. And the planet doesn't just exist in um, isolation. You know, we're part of a solar system as part of a galaxy. You know, there are, I believe we have many uh, extraterrestrial uh, neighbors, cousins, friends. But they they want us to know information. They want us to be cautioned. Do you want to get into that um, now, Preston? Yeah, yeah. I think you said a single word that really res, you know, that I empathize with uh, isolation, because we don't. You know, our actions do affect others. There's a ripple effect. Every thought we put out, we are not alone, <laughs> and we, you know, the mistakes we're making. Uh, do affect others, even beyond Earth. And this is one of the reasons I think UFOs came down in large numbers in 1947, which coincides precisely with the atomic age, when we really had the capacity, and we're actually doing it, to destroy each other. Uh, We were exploding nuclear bombs. And this apparently, according to the contactees, because this is part of all of this chapter, Uh, When we do that, this rips into other dimensions and is destroying things in ways we have no idea. Mm -hmm. So it's no coincidence UFOs showed up at that time when we finally had the capacity to destroy all life on this planet. And this speaks to the ET agenda, their goal, their mission, which is manyfold. I mean, there's many reasons why they're here. And we can, I think if you look at the first-hand cases, uh, you can see this. The evidence speaks for itself. This is where we look to for answers on the subject. Is people who are having contact and people who are taken on board and gotten any communication are all saying the same thing. We know what the goal of being visited is. One, it's healing, certainly, uh, because people are pulled on board and their genetics are taken and they're healed of all kinds of stuff. This is a major part of contact. Also being taught information. They'll take you down to the engine room, tell you how the craft works. So you know there are other energy sources besides fossil fuels. They will take you up to the control room and say, listen, here's how we fly our craft. We use electromagnetics. We follow the gravitational field line. They'll explain it in detail. Um, They also will basically impart warnings prophecies even and this is a big big part of it i've had a lot of people requesting that i do some research on this because so many people have this experience and if you're going to get a message from ets it's going to be along these lines certainly i mean there may be a lot said but certainly this will be said Uh, and i don't care if it's grays or tall whites or praying mantis or human looking or little blue beings or what have you the message is the same. And one, the first is warnings about nuclear proliferation or the use of nuclear material in any capacity. And they give that, they say that same thing. You know, you're affecting areas you're not aware of. You're on the pathway to complete self-destruction. We can turn these off. We know where all your nuclear materials are. They give various messages to people, but they will say this over and over and over again. Not only say it, If you look at the actual cases, almost every nuclear base, (laughs) nuclear missile site, nuclear vehicle, nuclear power plant, nuclear waste has been visited all across our planet. 
-hmm. So it's not just words, it's action. Mm -hmm. uh, now, also, they warn about uh, greed and corruption, war and aggression. We're very, very concerned about how we're treating ourselves and each other. And like you said, the planet, they warn about the chopping down of the forests, the polluting of our waters, the our food supply, all of this, people are warned over and over again. And every major researcher who focuses on cases of direct contact has these. Thomas Bullard was the first to do a statistical analysis of onboard experiences. And he said, this is a big, big part of it. Bud Hopkins, of course, and David Jacobs and John Mack and all of them agree that ETs are giving these same warnings. Now, people have different ideas about it. And it's funny for, to me when you know these researchers are saying, well, I think what's going on here is the ETs are just basically telling these things which aren't predictive, have no predictive value, but are just to study the emotional reaction of the witness, hmm. uh, which is pure speculation and frankly, not what the witnesses are saying. Mm -hmm. So I looked into this. And even the researchers who are saying this are quoting the witnesses who are saying, well, no, I think it's true. I think this is, they're giving actual predictions. And other people feel like, well, maybe it's scare tactics. You know, they're just trying to scare us a little bit so we will take action. I don't know. You know, Whitley Strieber had this happen to him. And he's like kind of trying to sort this out. He says, you know, I don't know. But the fact is what they told me would happen is happening. It's mm -hmm. happening. We're mm -hmm. seeing it in front of our very eyes. So I think we have to take it seriously. Yeah. Somebody said that. Yeah. Because it I, is. Again, the experts are saying nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Again, you know, there's so much evidence to support, um, you know, the warnings from ET. And we can see for ourselves if our eyes are open. Um, you know, there is a problem. There is something going on um, that is, um, you know, our, our food supply is becoming toxic, our environment's becoming toxic, our water supply, and it's not, it's not boding well for humanity. But then again, there's the ripple effect to the entire planet. We're not the only species living here, you know, so. I mean, they told this contactee I interviewed up in Maine, Thoughts are things. The power of intention is real. What you're putting out, this greed and negativity is having huge destructive effects. Stop it. You know, in symmetry with Dolly Saffron, this was a big part of the ET message. They're warning all about coronal mass ejections, the sun micronoving. Yes. Um, you know, the possibility of a axial pole tilt has been discussed many times by ETs. There's an Italian contactee, Walter Rizzi, was told flat out, <laughs> your earth is going to tilt at some point. Um, when I heard that, I'm like, wow, here we go again. How many times do we have to receive the same messages? Mm -hmm. And you know, wherever you look to for knowledge, whether it's mainstream scientists, Native American elders, uh, channelers, uh, out of body got astral travelers, near death experiencers, uh, all are receiving these messages. Yep. Mainstream scientists all over the world are like, yes, there's, you know, we've polluted our entire planet. Uh, if you look at a map of the forests, how they were, you know, 100, 200 years ago to now, you will cry. It yep. is devastating. Yep. We and... are on a pathway that is at this point irreversible. That's what they told Kevin Kamen, a contactee. They said they showed him all these disasters, mm -hmm. hurricanes, tornadoes, landslides, earthquakes. They said these will happen. You started a countdown clock when you started exploding nuclear bombs. You cannot stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. And they gave him all of these predictions. He says it looked real. <laughs> he says it was like looking out of a window. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, he would see them happen on the news. Unfortunately, he passed not too long ago. I'm so sad. 
oh, he's such a nice guy and such an amazing encounter with these 15 foot tall praying mantis ETs who basically, yeah, were just warning him. So I hope we listen. I really do. Yeah, me too. I'm wondering, Preston, have you heard, have have any of them said anything about CERN, you know, the, the large Hadron Collider in Switzerland? Um, I can't say I've heard a case where that, that's specifically mentioned, um, but I will say uh, in 1954 in France, there was a massive super wave, October and November, where objects landed i mean there's a hundred cases of landings in a period of two months 200 cases really but and a thousand sightings something crazy was going on i'm like what's going on why 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 and so i delved into the history of what's going on at that time cern cern mm -hmm. had just opened mm -hmm. and it was not far away uh and that's when supposedly our own secret governments had really kind of started reverse engineering anti-gravity technology mm -hmm. apparently we were starting to do some really dangerous things mm -hmm. so i think yeah they've made it clear that they do know about it mm -hmm. to anyone who's willing to do the research into it mm -hmm. yeah so we've been we've been warned now preston we're quickly running out of time but before we say goodbye to the viewers and the listeners I'm wondering if we've left anything out. Is there anything you would like to add to the discussion or to tell the, you know, the, the listeners and the viewers or um, you want to sum it all up or do you want to draw attention to something else in the book that I missed? Well, we didn't cover it all because it wasn't time, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, there's some interesting chapters in there for sure. I thought the stories about the American sitcom and how the subject is treated has a lot to say. <laughs> Uh, but I, I did a chapter on uh, alien books, which I thought was super fascinating, especially mm -hmm. after finding out about Dolly Saffron having an E.T. book and Betty Andreessen and Betty Hill, of course, seeing a book. And uh, Mike's, or what's his name? Richard Silver. I, I forget his last first name. Um, S-E-L-V-E-R. He, he just put out a book. Uh, so, yeah, that's interesting. But no, I mean, we covered a lot. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this book. It hit number one. I'm so grateful and humble. It's like, wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the only message I would give to people is clearly it's time to move past, like you said, skepticism and disbelief and ridicule. The evidence speaks for itself. Uh, we really need to form a consensus on what's going on here. Move beyond the fear. It's not warranted. Don't believe our lying governments. Mm -mm. And just remember that we are all being contacted on some level. Um, there's no need to fear. Just allow love and truth to guide your actions. Yes, we may be going through some tough times up ahead, but we're immortal beings. And we're going to be just fine. And we have friends who are watching over us who are doing their best to help us without basically stepping in and taking over because they can't. Mm -hmm. They respect our karma. We have to learn this lesson. We made our bed. We have to fix it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's an exciting time <laughs> to be alive sure on planet is. Earth, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank sure you. is. Thank you so much. Now, before we say goodbye, also, do you, for those especially on audio, would you like to say where people can reach you? Yeah, thanks, Karen. I've, it's super easy to reach me. I have a website, PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. Got a YouTube channel. I'm all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I do a podcast with Dolly Saffron, The Light Gate, each yes. Monday evening, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. My books are on Amazon and online retailers near you. And yeah, you can contact me through Facebook or my website or my YouTube channel or any of those. So I really appreciate that you giving me this opportunity <laughs> to talk on this subject, which is so important and so interesting. Oh, it, it really is. And thank you so much for, for joining me, Preston. Always a pleasure. Love to hear what you have to say. It's relevant. It's It's important. It's inspiring. It's interesting. You're quite the guy. And I just really appreciate you very much. 
And I'm so grateful that you were able to make time to come on the show today. So I also want to, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I feel the same way about you, Karen, just so you know. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And um, so um, I want to also wish the viewers and the listeners um, much success and love and light and good things to come into your life. I want to thank you also for making the time to join us. Please do share this exciting, interesting episode with your friends and your family. And again, the links will be below. So I guess that's it for today. And we'll see you next week on the Quantum Guide Show. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the Quantum Guide Show. Become the change that you wish to see in the world. Subscribe to my YouTube and other channels at Karen Holton TV. Click the like button, leave me a comment, and share this podcast with your friends. Check out my website at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com to see my free resources and amazing products and services. All the links will be in the description below. As part of the Forbidden Knowledge Network, you will find the Quantum Guide Show with Karen Holton and also the Aliens and Angels podcast on all audio platforms. Until next time, keep up the good work.